really called forward momentum. It's mm. like continuing the momentum forward, whether whether characters are uh, in a scene where they're they're sitting, then the narrative, the discussion has to be moving forward into mysterious places. If they're moving through the forest and they're getting somewhere and a, there's a destination, then things have to happen along the way to make it to make it interesting. So the idea is that uh, forward momentum visually and forward momentum story wide. Ed, how's it going? Hey, how you doing? I'm doing good. Where are you at? I'm in Indianapolis. Oh, okay. Not far from me. I'm in Chicago. Oh, awesome. What are you doing in Indy? Are you from there or? My wife's from here. So okay. We're visiting. There you go. <laughs> are you enjoying it at all? Or? I, love it. I think it, things are pretty open out there, aren't they? In, in Indy. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah, take it, thing. yeah take advantage while you can you know <laughs> well i'm glad that you you found some time you know even visiting family to talk to me so <laughs> i appreciate that no problem so uh yeah i'm gonna jump into the to the film and uh you know this is this is kind of if if people have followed your work this is kind of up your alley totally uh, a genre of this and a movie of this magnitude and in a sense you know as a fan of 24 it definitely had some uh, reminiscent uh, you know points during it but you know what i was kind of surprised one thing that really surprised me is like i, I remember see, i mean barry pepper i've been watching him for years but i don't know if i kind of seen him in kind of like his grizzled kind of more matured i mean he you know like kind of a in in a sense a a, a um Neam Leeson type role in a sense. It's like if you mix Kiefer Sutherland and Neam, Liam Neeson, I think you kind of had Barry Pepper in this film. Um, tell me about the casting because I thought it was really interesting. I think that's really interesting because uh, I think you've nailed it because hmm. those were kind of you know the two actors that that I think you know would would really work for this role if we wanted them instead of Barry. Um, uh, Barry was my first choice because. He, I worked with him back uh, years ago on a show called Outer Limits. Uh -huh. Played uh, one of us, one of my soldiers in the, and he was one of the first people to die. And, and um, it was very interesting because uh, we haven't worked together since then. And that was years ago. So uh, when his name came up for this film, I was like, yeah, absolutely. Because of his, you know, he, he doesn't do uh, lead roles. He hasn't done many. Mm -hmm. um, he done the biopics, of course. And he was lead, the lead role of that, playing Ur, uh, Urquhart and, um, and uh, what's his name? Uh, not Mantle, but um, not such a big baseball fan. Anyway, oh, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking Roger about. Roger Maris. Roger, Roger Maris. Maris, that's right, the Yankee, you know, Roger Maris. Of course. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, he he was ripe for this role. We, it, I mean, it was almost written for him. It wasn't, but it, you know, feels like it was almost written for him because he did such a perfect job. He was such a, you know, he's such a studied actor and he's so good at, um, at you know, bringing something to the role that uh, it, was, it was a real pleasure. How was it reconnecting after all these years? You guys remember working together? Do you, you had any fond memories of you killing him off early? Uh, how, did, how did that conversation kind of rekindling happen after so many years and kind of getting to work? And he's in a different stage of his career too, which was kind of cool to see in a movie like this. I'm like, oh, this is a little bit of a different Barry Pepper here too. Yeah, when, when we contacted Barry and we were talking to me, an initial phone call with me and we talked about it, I reminded him that he was in The Outer Limits. And he went, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, it was the first thing on my mind, of course, um, which is really interesting because, you know, you work with actors like Barry who are so well prepared and so into what they're doing. Um, it's, it's, re it's memorable for a director because, you know, I've worked with a lot of actors and they all bring different things to the role, but there are like a handful of actors that really know how to dig in and make that, uh, character work and and once I reminded Barry that we'd worked together he, he started to remember and I think he started to recall that it was a good a positive experience for him and uh, you know it, you know it just it seemed like he meshed with the character he liked me as a director 
and it was a uh, you know let's do it yeah when, when you do a film like this and in essence you know barry's character really the film kind of revolves around him and he carries it in so many ways do you and especially knowing the quality of actor he is as you mentioned do you kind of let him take his own version like how how you as a director do you kind of let the player do his you know run his plays in a sense in that essence or is it kind of uh, we're going by the script and kind of your vision how much do you give him a playroom in a sense uh for an actor of that caliber to kind of you know what he sees in a character and kind of do things maybe i don't know improvising is the word but allowing him to insert his version of it too we had barry and i had a long lots of long conversations about the script in advance of shooting we also um, talked a lot about character but mm -hmm. you talk about my process my process is clear i read the script and and make this movie based on the story and whoever is going to end up playing those roles brings their personality to the character. So I don't get in the way of anything that on a personal level he feels about a moment or he, he feels about uh, how he's gonna, we're gonna stage the action or any of that. So I never get in the way because I'm not the one on the screen. He's the one on the screen. Right. And I want him to be comfortable in that character. But uh, there's clear guidance in terms of visually how I'm gonna make the movie. Also how um, the characters around him will be cast and molded. And also I think that I kind of spend most of the time being a custodian of the script and making sure the story makes sense and that we're on track to tell a great story. And I, I'm a big believer in the fact that every scene has a beginning, middle and end, no matter how mm -hmm. small it is. And you know, a good example is when you're on a drone shot and the car comes into frame and it stops, that's got a beginning, middle, and an end. And you know, as a filmmaker, you really have to think about that because that make that gives the the film dimension because you're not just saying, okay, this this is just a scene that takes from A to B. No, it's a scene that should have some flow to it. And then when you put them all together, it's much more satisfying because you've got some dimension in every scene. That's an interesting perspective. You know, I was going to ask you kind of about that in general. You, you've been in the game a long time, you know, as a, as a producer and as a director, and, and the industry's evolved to so many different ways. And, uh, you know, especially on the genre like this, which you're very familiar with, you know, the kind of the, the spy, the thriller, the action, the use of drones, like you mentioned, this is something kind of fairly new. You, you've been in the game for, for a few decades here and uh, you didn't have these sort of things to play with, you know? But now when you get this new technology like drones, especially in genre like this, which is quick pace, it's it's kind of, you know, there's a lot of pacing is important in it too. Uh, how do you use these kind of new technologies? Has it been, a, 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 in a sense, something you wish you had earlier in your career? Or, I mean, do you take it favorably the usage of these kind of new equipment to, to use such as drones for example oh yes i embrace all the new technology i'm totally up to date with what's happening i own two drones of myself my oh nice <laughs> i uh, i practice with them all the time so i can see i can get a sense of uh you know what they're capable of and what i can do and and i call it a new you know when i was in my younger days of my career I, you know crane was very special so yeah drone is the new crane and all you do is say, okay, I can get a bigger, fancier, it's a combination between a helicopter and a crane because mm. you can use it in many different ways. They can, they can fly into people's hand, operators' hands and you can carry on the shot. Um, there's a lot of things you can do with it, but it's interesting, the drone technology from the time I bought my original uh, DJ, DJI drone, mm -hmm. it, um, it's increased a, a, a lot. It's, it's, um, it's interesting. It's kind of like when you start with the Chapman crane and you end up with the, you know, the telescopic, uh, you know, mega cranes that we use on Shannara Chronicles. And then you add the drone in, you just, it, it becomes, you know, it just becomes, it, you've got to take the drone and say, how am I using it as a visual storing, uh, a visual storytelling tool? Mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of what I did in this, on this uh, movie. I felt like I needed it tonally because I needed um, things to set settle in. I needed the idea of wide space when he was out in the country. I needed the feel of 
just never ending, you know, in never ending pastures and woods, and then one place. And it, and the story that it told was that that guy could scream as loud as he wants. He doesn't need anything on his mouth because guess what? It, it's only there so that it doesn't, you know, doesn't hurt Nicholas's ears. And mm-hmm. the idea, um, and, and yes, absolutely. I mean, I remember the steady cam, you know, coming to be, and it's like, wow. And now, you know, handheld is really much more the, the feel that people want than steady cam. Although Steadicam has still has its place, you know, so all of the new technology. But the biggest thing, I think the biggest thing that if you're asking about me adapting to technology, was we shot 24 on film for the entire run up to season eight. Wow. It was always on film. It was never uh when Kiefer was playing the lead role, it was never on uh digital. And that was the moment that I left film behind and started with digital. And the whole digital technology is amazing because when I get into color correction and I start playing with the images, um, the latitude I have with digital technology is amazing. Plus the ease of editing, well, everything that that's comes with it. So when you ad- adapt to these new technologies, you realize really it's making it uh, making a lot of things more available to me. As a mm-hmm. That makes sense. Totally. In that essence, you know, you got to, you got more tools to play with. So why not use it, you know, to, to kind of make your job easier and more dynamic in that way too, you know, so makes complete sense. You know, I always wondered when it comes to kind of the genre of, of action and thrillers and that something you've been familiar with, how do you kind of direct that? Cause I'm, I'm, there's always something going on. You always need to keep the audience engaged and, you know, not, not tipping them off and necessarily what's going to happen next with the twists and turns in the story, but just the pacing of it. I, I'm always curious to know, like, how do you direct sort of this genre in a way? Um, because there's a lot of things you got to navigate and certain obstacles you got to overcome just to keep the viewer engaged and, kind of, you know, it's, it's a roller coaster in a lot of ways too, but is there a certain approach that you use to directing this sort of genre of uh, like action thrillers? Yeah, it's really called forward momentum. It's mm. like continuing the momentum forward, whether, whether characters are uh, in a scene where they're, they're sitting, then the narrative, the discussion has to be moving forward into mysterious places. If they're moving through the forest and they're getting somewhere, and there's a destination, then things have to happen along the way to make it to make it interesting. So the idea is that uh, forward momentum visually and forward momentum story-wise. So the audience is learning things. And one of the uh, best stories I have for 24 was was uh, I'm in a store buying a television, and the uh, and the uh, the salesman, you know, finds out I worked on 24. He said, I don't know how you guys do it. It never stops. The mm-hmm. moment I think that, oh, wait a minute, that doesn't make any, before I say sense, something else is happening. And I, I forgotten about how ridiculous that last moment was in my mind. I've forgotten about it because we're vaulting forward to the next beat. And that's a really important um, lesson I learned from an innocent bystander was basically the most important thing is anything can be ridiculous in a movie as long as you move on to something even more interesting next. Mm-hmm. You know, she starts thinking about, it's, it's when it stops and you start thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, that doesn't make any, wait, oh, wait a minute, you know, this is happening. And that is a really important rule in any of these thrillers and, and uh, action movies that I've done is that I've always tried to keep that forward momentum going. and. If I feel like there's a moment in the script where it's going to stop and it's going to give people a chance to think about how ridiculous something was that happened, uh, you know, no, let's move on to something bigger. Let's make this bigger. Let's make this a more interesting visual. Whatever it is, it's the tiny light, you know, shining in the corner that you could you notice. That kind of thing. That's that's what you have to do as an action director to keep it moving forward. And the other thing is a lot of people think you get a lot of momentum from never or for never ending action sequences the same one i don't believe in that i believe in finishing it fast and making it go fast then the next quiet moment you're thinking about wow that was cool 
that was cool, that was cool. As opposed to, there was just too many moments, I don't remember one, it was all cool, but it was just, it, it kind of was tiresome. So I have a, you know, I have a gauge for that in my, uh, the way I make a film. Oh, that's interesting. It makes complete sense too, especially when it, the plot points too, when, when a lot of times, things come full circle and there's a lot of like reveals like on shows like 24 like you mentioned there's always a cliffhanger there's always something coming back you know, that happened 10 episodes before that makes sense 10 episodes later you know keeping that momentum and you kind of have to forget about it or distract in a sense the viewer so they don't remember they can put it together so that shock value is even bigger too but then they can re recall it be like oh that made sense because this is this what happened but you kind of that forward momentum that you're talking about it distracts them for the time being to set them up for the next thing. That is a really clever and interesting perspective, really. Thank you. I but like the other, it. The other thing is that, you know, action, action is one thing, but tension is really important. Mm -hmm. That's what we used. I, I, I really brought a lot of that to this movie because I was just going to ask you that you took my question. Already. How do you build tension? You know, how do you build it genuinely too? the most, you know, the most important part is that Barry really bought into it. Mm. Bought into the whole idea that the lead character has a, a paranoid side to him. And he is watching his back all the time. And as soon as the lead character embodies that, you start to see that in the film. You start to feel it. When he's look, you know, when we first meet him and he's looking around and you see him do various things that, that are kind of odd, but they're not, you know, He's also going through his daily routine, drinking tea and relaxing. Uh, but there are little things that come on. And that's when the audience goes, wait a minute, what is he doing? Why is he doing that? And that is cool when he opens the, his closet and is like, whoa, what is that? Uh -huh. you know, that, that was the whole idea of supply. And, and Barry was not only totally buying into that, he was adding to it. Once he got the feel for it, he was, he was continuing contributing ideas for that. And it's, it's not always what's around the next dark corner. It's like you have to set up moments that reveal as no problem. Exactly. Those moments up, oh, this was a bit of, no, that's nothing. And then, and then what happens is the, guard, the audience starts to let its guard down slightly and then, then you hit them with something big. That's so it's right. A, it's a matter of like getting used to the tension and then not, not totally relying on the fact that it's going to be something spooky. Yeah, because, I mean, horror movie tropes are usually the music changes and you know something's coming. I hate that because I like it when I think uh, when, when you just don't expect it, you're just watching it. It's it's completely there's no musical guide that that, you know, there's no tonal guide to, to set you up for something coming up and it just hits you. I think James Wan has done it really well with his like kind of a slap in your face, you know, out of nowhere, kind of uh, jump scares or whatnot. I think that's a great way of building tension. and you just illustrate and elaborate on it that when when you don't expect it that's the best when it's just something very casual or or you know it kind of it, it tricks you as a viewer and it just hits you like that i think that's the most uh satisfactory tension building when you don't know when it's happening correct it's 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 a technique it's a you know it's a technique that's been used forever but uh michael uh, andrew uh lockington and michael white who did the music for the film mm -hmm. they just, they're, they're releasing the soundtrack the same day it's opening in theaters but but they were really on top of that they didn't want to get ahead of what was happening visually we talked long a long time about that. i think they were the first ones to really identify what this movie would end up being you know kind of a revenge th thriller and, mm -hmm. uh, and it was it was very interesting how they were so in line with what my visual sense was because they were sending me movie while our, our music while I was shooting the movie. So it was really interesting because it was kind of motivating me to, to make that, to keep the tension going, to keep that kind of shallow feel to his life that all of a sudden got loaded up, you know, and then, and then, you know, it comes back to a, a combination of both. Mm hmm you know, you, another interesting aspect about your career, I mean, you've done feature, I mean, you've done, this is obviously a feature film, but you've done so many shows and series, and 
always interests me about directors for television. I mean, you spend a significant time on 24, but you've done a lot of shows where you just done a two, three episodes and you kind of jump in show to show. And I always wonder as a filmmaker, like how do you get adjusted to this kind of process where you just come in, it's an already established franchise. You just jump in for a few episodes and move on and move on. How familiar do you have to get with each show that you jump in on? Like, how does that process work? Cause I always found it like, Oh my God, it seems overwhelming to be jumping in from show to show as they're, you know, midway through or whatnot for a few episodes and different genres sometimes and moving on. How did you kind of manage that throughout your career? Because I always found that as a fascinating aspect of kind of uh, television directors in a way. It's, it's one of the most difficult parts of being a television director. Um, there's been two or three times in my career where I said, you really uh, want me to direct this? <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, um, and that I was more in the science fiction uh, side of things because, you know, sometimes the worlds they build are so complicated that, uh, and I think the answer that I got from the showrunner is a good answer. They want me to stick with what I do and stick with the story and, and make that story work within the, you know, within the world. They said, don't worry about the world. The world's all written in the script. Mm. What we want you to do is make this episode work with all the tools that you have and tell this story, tell the story that's inherent in this particular episode. And I pretty well focused on that as a television director. I'm not saying it's easy because it's not. It's not, it be thrown into something is, uh, there's a lot of, um, the biggest part is there's a lot of different perspectives and egos to deal with. Oh yeah. I think you have to be the guy or the or the woman who sits back and goes, you know what? Um, I'm gonna I'm here for the ride. I'm gonna guide you if you're off track with the story. I love what you do. I'm going to embrace your style stylistically, and I'm going to listen to everybody. And everybody uh, that's been there has been there a lot longer than I have. So you listen to everybody. You fit in, and you add whatever you can to make that episode bigger and better in a cleaner looking episode. And, and that's kind of how I approach it. It's like whatever I can add to it to make it better, if I can elevate the material based on all the people doing their job, that's what I focus on and try to, um, try to fit in. Do you just focus on the particular episodes or how much of the show story do you need to know? Let's say it's a show's like in its third or fourth season and these are characters are established and whatnot. I'd imagine you can't possibly know like details about all these shows that you jump in for a few episodes. Do you just kind of rely then on the writers and the producers in a sense uh, to kind of guide you in that essence? Or do you come in with like, some legitimate knowledge of the show that you do say, like homework on you definitely do your homework you you have to get to know the show you've got to watch you know my my the way i do it is i watch even if it was it was three years ago i watched the pilot mm -hmm. I see where it starts i watch a few episodes normally what i do is ask the showrunners for half a dozen episodes of their favorite episodes and that usually is a pretty good indicator of what they're looking for you know i obviously have a script that's that's got a beginning, middle, and end in a story. And usually, you know, every script embodies one particular A story that has to be told. And I embrace that. And then I look stylistically at the examples they send to me. I mean, you can't, you know, if a new show has been running for, especially a network show has been running for three years, that's a lot of episodes to, to get through. Mm -hmm. And you're not, gonna, you're not, you don't need to. You need to bring a, a fresh approach in terms of telling that particular story, but you're not, you're not reworking everything. You're not reworking the playbook. You're just fitting a couple of new, you know, moves in. Mm -hmm. It's like you're a coach. You're calling a few plays, but the the game plan and the the offense is already in place. You know, in that sense. You know, I I came into 24 late. I think I started randomly at season six. You know, I came into the show, and you've worked for most of all of the the run in some capacity of it. And, um, and I got, I was managed to got into it after season six and ride it through. I still need to get back and start it from the beginning. Cause I've kind of forgotten a lot of things, but do you remember kind of the conversations you guys had about how to end this show? Cause it had such a long run. We're talking almost like a nearly a decade run of a show that's, you know, uh, so popular with, with a built-in fan base in a lot of ways 
what was kind of discussions how to end this all after all these years? Was there, uh, in a sense, different versions of it? Or did you guys know even going into the final season how you wanted to end things off? And how much input did Kiefer even have uh, on it too? I'm, I'm just kind of curious how how you wrapped the bowl, you know, in a sense for such a iconic series. Well, you know, the, the discussions, I, I actually directed the final episode of the mm -hmm. Kiefer uh, 24 episode series. Yeah. And I, you know, we, it was still in discussion basically right up to the end of the you know, shooting the last episode. Oh, wow. Um, you know, I think there was a, uh, I think that Kiefer would have liked to have seen the character probably in much larger jeopardy than it was in the end. Uh, but, um, you know, it was such an important franchise to Fox that they wanted to keep him alive and keep him, you know, still existing. And I, you know, I still think there's a, there's a life for it. Um, we discussed many endings. Uh, we ended up where we ended up um, because that's the most satisfying we could come up for the audience. Nobody will ever be completely satisfied with the way it ended. Um, and it's, and I still feel like Fox has in the back of their head that, that um, you know, he will be either president or head of CTU and there'll be a new Jack Bauer. But that's, you know, that's going to be up to Joel Cernow and the, the guys that created the show. Um, that's how we saw it. We always saw, we, the other thing we always talked about were spinoffs of like a military 24 and that, mm. you, know, um, uh, you know, even a police 24. Uh, we saw those, but they never came to fruition because I, I believe now, in the way network television is working now, uh, we would have done that. We would there would have been three or four different versions of the show Twenty Four, where you do Twenty Four. Well, Fox does it now with Nine One One, you know, and yeah, totally. They, but that would be Twenty Four Hours of Nine One One as opposed to various episodes. So it's. It's also, they also know, the network and the studio knows how difficult it was to produce. <laughs> so, you know, it wasn't a walk in the park. It was not your normal procedural show. It was tough. Did they ever consider maybe to like a movie version, just like maybe, you know, years later, do just like a two hour movie version of it to kind of wrap things up or do an extension? I think Entourage did that. They did a movie version after the show ended its run, too. Uh, was that ever kind of in consideration? Yeah, it's no secret that uh, 24 the movie was definitely in the works. In fact, a funny story that the guy that um, was writing it and directing it, sat behind me while I was shooting the final episode. And at one point in time, he came forward and said, uh, I don't know how we're going to do a movie that's as good as this TV show. <laughs> and I said, well, that's your job. My job is get this one done. Uh huh. You think Kiefer would come back and do it again, or at least for a short, some cameo or appearance, if there was a, or maybe even like a mini series, a six episode or something like that? Or do you think at that point, when you were with him after all these years, he wanted to leave it in the past and, and kind of uh, leave Jack Bauer <laughs> as a memory? I think he is a love hate relationship with Jack Bauer. And I think mm. that Kiefer, um, you know, really enjoyed doing that character, but it was a ton of work for him. Oh yeah. I think, that, I think that, you know, it's can be very tiring because it was, there was so much involved to, and, and as an actor, it's not just the physical part of the job. It's the, you know, his immersion in this character that was so, you know, in a way so flawed. And he was, he was so immersed in it. I think that, that he got tired of it because, um, because it was so difficult to do and, and do it the level that he insisted on doing it. Uh, I have no, no idea what his thoughts are, but my guess would be that Kiefer would definitely, if, if he came up with the right, if he came up with the right script and the right idea for a continuance of that character, that he'd be definitely willing to entertain it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I always thought like, uh, you know, killing off Jack Bauer would have been certainly the end of it, you know, <laughs> for good, I guess. Um, but always an open ended thing always allows something to potentially happen if if any everyone chooses to, you know. Wanted to end off things by by asking you, you know, obviously film has been such a big part of your life in so many aspects, but what are some of your, I always feel like to be a, a great actor, director, just it, 
person in the industry, you have to have a rich life outside of it. You know, you just don't come in like I'm a director in life. You know, you, you always bring in, like you mentioned that, that, the that whole thing with the TV store, uh, you know, buying a TV, how that kind of influenced your work. But um, what are some things you enjoy uh, in your everyday life outside of the industry that you just kind of gravitate to or consider hobbies or interests or just go away to clear your mind? Because, you know, you definitely need that aspect of it. Well, for, for years, actually, when I was doing 24, I owned a gallery, an art gallery. Really? I actually, I, I don't, and I'm also a photographer, but but I had a gallery that um, I owned up in Canada and uh, it was called Turner Gallery and it was open for 10 years. It was actually open from 2000 to 2010. And, uh, uh, you know, so I'm still basically in that game. I still you know, sell art and, and, and I love, love it. I go anytime I can to the, uh, museums and, hmm. and, and that's what I dabble in. And I'm also a photographer, and, I, and when I had the gallery, I sold my photography at the um, at the gallery. And it's an interesting note: the gallery was in the town that we shot Trigger Point in. So the small town. Oh wow! That, that was my, that's my hometown. That's where I grew up. And that's it's unbelievable. Never, was it yeah, done by purpose or, or just by coincidence? Or well, we were shooting up in Canada. Um, we needed a town where he was hiding out in. Mm -hmm. And I said, let's use Bayfield. No one's ever shot there. It was, it's a small town on Lake Huron. A lot of people from Detroit come up because it's only two and a half hours from Detroit. And uh, we used Bayfield as his town, his hideout town. So uh, uh, it was great because that's where I had my art gallery. That's where I, you know, spent, spent my childhood. And uh, the, just the experience that the townspeople had with with the filmmaking experience. And, and I was always a bit of a mystery to everybody in town because, you know, <laughs> there's this guy that apparently goes off and does 24 and, you know, I guess he, he must do something important. But basically I was just a normal person because I grew up there my whole life. Mm -hmm. And then when they saw the trucks come in and the movie being set up and, and us changing the interiors of, you know, all of the diner and the bookstore, they went, wow, a lot goes into this. And I said, yeah, this is this is my life. And they had no idea. So it was kind of fun and entertaining to do it in my hometown. They just thought of you as the art gallery guy, you know, <laughs> probably. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's something. That's that must be a cool thing to kind of come full circle. You know, uh, you stayed in town, too. You never left. That That's a, that's a great part of it, too. You know, you remained a local no matter what. You know, the lure of Hollywood didn't take you away. So you kept grounded that way. That's right. I love it. That that's fantastic. I'm curious, what kind of art is it? Just um, you mentioned your own photographs. Is there spe specific things you like to shoot, or and specific art that you like to collect? Uh, it's it, it's a it's a it's a you know different different modes. Most I, I like I really like abstract art, but I, I don't hmm. I don't have any problem with with any like figurative stuff. I, all of that stuff I like it all. I'm I'm I like contemporary. I'm not much into the historical. Mm -hmm. art. I like the contemporary art and because I'm Canadian originally uh, I, I really focus on Canadian artists so I try to I try to promote them and keep them get them going especially when I when they you know when their work draws me in so and photography and anything you you specifically like to shoot or just kind of also abstract and, and just things that pique your interest that you kind of come across yeah most mostly landscapes mm. you know I, done a lot of landscape work so that's my, my focus and and also i've got a a lot of historical work in uh around bayfield my hometown mm -hmm. so i've got i've and, and that's actually in the gallery that's where i sold most of was some of my historical work that's when i was a younger and i was shooting a shooting black and white film uh a lot of those images i've reproduced for uh, my work in the gallery that's fantastic. You see, these are the kind of nuggets I love to get, you know, because we're all people. We have so many outside interests, uh, you know, not just known for the work that you do. But that's that's fantastic that you have this whole other world that you're immersed with, that you've been passionate about and, and you know, kind of made it a reality, you know, so that that's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. I, yeah again, it was there was no uh, there was art galleries in our, our town, but there was no real fine art gallery that focused completely on uh, Canadian art. So I, I really wanted to keep the focus on 
just that and bring something back because you know we are in a artistic business filmmaking yeah. is an artistic business so i'd made you know i'd made my living doing that so i thought i'd like to give a little bit back to the community and making the film trigger point in the town uh was just an extension of giving back no no question about it you know give some notoriety to the town and, and maybe some extra income and revenue, you know, with locals and all that businesses, that's fantastic. Kind of giving back uh, to your town, you know, br bringing them some, a slice of something they're not used to. So um, that's awesome. I, I, like I said, I've been a big fan of your work. Uh, I love 24. I, I'm going to start really soon. I do have all the seasons. I bought all the DVDs, the collection. So I'm going to start it from the beginning and uh, kind of ride the ride again, but uh, awesome job. Really enjoyed Trigger. Uh, Trigger Point, it, it just, it kind of, it, it, I love those kind of gritty thrillers that, that uh, keep you basically on the edge, you know, and connected to it. And I think you've done a fantastic job and, and I like hearing what it goes into making that. So uh, looking forward to your next two projects too. I see that you have on the horizon and uh, keep it up, Brad, because you've been doing great work. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And like, like I say, we will be doing two more of these films with Barry if, uh, if this film does well. So I just, plead for everybody to watch the film because I think that's going to be worth the ride. Absolutely. Especially fans of, of your previous work, 24. I think they're going to, like I said, I read, I, I picked up a lot of things too. It's like, if you're a fan of that, uh, I think you're going to really enjoy this film too, in a lot of ways. So uh, awesome. And I, I, I'll do my best to put the word out, word out there. I know you will. Thank you so much for this. Absolutely, Brad. Thanks for the time. Enjoy Indianapolis and Indiana. And uh, I'll talk to you soon on the next one. That sounds good. I'm, I'm, I'm up for it. Absolutely. Take care. Stay safe Take and care. healthy. See you. Bye-bye. Bye now.